first sight, cross sections through thrust belts can show bewildering complexity. And this section through the foothills of the Canadian Cordillera in Alberta is no exception. But actually, the individual structures in here are pretty simple. And we can illustrate this through some simple animations of thrust structures that combine to create the complexity we can see in the section. We'll be looking at three simple animations, one of an individual fault and then two others on how arrays of faults in thrust belts can combine. So let's start off with the individual thrust structure. We're going to start off with beds horizontal and a thrust that has climbed up through the stratigraphy but has yet to move. The segments of the fault that are parallel to bedding are called flats and these flats are linked by steeper segments that we call ramps. Here we've picked out the lower side of the ramp called the foot wall, marked in blue, and the hanging wall above in red. Okay, so let's move on the fault plane. And the hanging wall moves up and off to the left. In this animation, we've kept the foot wall fixed and all the actions happen by the hanging wall moving over the top. We can see the foot wall ramp still remains and the hanging wall ramp has been moved up and over and we can identify these features by the termination of bedding coming against the fault plane. And as a consequence, the rocks in the hanging wall have been folded up into an antiform. It's called a fault bend fold. And here's an example in nature from Oman. Let's add some graffiti. There goes the thrust, climbing across the stratigraphy, and we've identified it from the terminations of bedding. There's the bedding. There's the termination in the foot wall. So that's the foot wall ramp. And there's the hanging wall ramp that once joined up with the foot wall. So those are the components of an individual thrust climbing up through the stratigraphy, creating a fault bend fold. Now let's go on and see how multiple thrusts work. And the starting point for this is the duplex model, as published here by Steve Boyer and Dave Elliott. It shows some stratigraphy stacked up by a series of thrusts beneath a major thrust sheet shown here in light blue. In this model, new thrusts progressively form in the foot wall of previously active ones. As a consequence, higher thrusts are folded by these newer, lower thrusts. And because these higher thrusts are being carried, the overall sequence is generally referred to as piggyback. The duplex then develops by the foot wall ramp progressively collapsing, accreting new rocks into the thrust system. So let's see how this works. We've got our thrust sheet running over the top, and at this stage, the underlying strata yet to thrust. So we grow a new thrust and move it. Grow a new thrust and move that. Grow a new thrust and move that. And so it can continue. And here's an example from the mine thrust belt. We can see the individual components. So let's add some terminology. The upper thrust is called a roof thrust, the lower one a floor thrust, and the individual thrust slices are often referred to as horses. So there's a nice stack of horses in the photograph. The result of all this thrusting is a well-ordered, highly predictive structure. Let's look along the floor thrust. You can see that it glides in the same unit, the oldest one involved in the duplex. How about the roof thrust? Well, this glides along the top of the youngest unit within the duplex. So, faced with drawing cross sections through duplexes, we can use the stratigraphic content to predict the positions of the main bounding thrusts. It sounds simple, but actually duplexes can come in many shapes and sizes. Let's have a look at another type. 
So again, we're going to have a thrust sheet run over a stack of strata, and that strata in the foot walls of the thrust sheet will itself begin to fold. Let's see what happens this time. We've grown a thrust, and now we've moved it, and now we've grown another one. The upper slice is attached to the overriding thrust sheet. We've abandoned part of that original higher thrust, and now we're about to move on the next thrust surface. There we go. We've accreted another horse onto our overriding thrust sheet. And let's do it again. So this time, the individual thrust slices have bunched up. The roof thrust and its thrust sheet above have been bulged up, and our stack of imbricate slices or horses are making a large fold structure. Let's look at this back corner, and you can see that the thrusts which started off forming at relatively low angles have been back rotated as other thrust slices have been stacked up underneath. And it's that back rotation that's diagnostic of the forward migration of the thrust pile. Well, here's an example from the Moyne thrust belt, and it shows the back rotation of thrust slices. It's the trailing edge of one of these types of thrust systems. It contrasts with the earlier duplex model in which the individual thrusts and the strata they contain generally dip towards the right where the thrust came from, towards the hinterland. So in the top version, we have something that's referred to as a hinterland dipping duplex. In the lower one, we have an antiformal stack duplex. We generate these different duplex types simply by changing the displacement on the individual imbricate thrusts within the duplex. We could also do it by changing the spacing of the individual imbricate thrusts and hence the size of the horses. So we've just looked at some very simple thrust structures in these animations. We've looked at how a fault bend fold can form simply as a consequence of a thrust climbing a staircase. And we've looked at how individual thrusts can combine to make a duplex structure. And in turn, in changing the pattern of displacement within a duplex, we can change its structure from hinterland dipping to an antiformal stack. You can find out more about duplex systems by looking at these two references here. I hope you found this short video useful for developing understanding of thrust systems.